Father God, some bizarre things have happened this morning, things that I just don't know why they've happened. And, you know, that's had an impact on the way I'm thinking right now. I just pray that you'll help me get rid of that. Lord, I want to bring that to the cross, and I, I, I want to bring us all to the cross. Actually, I, I want you just to touch this place and these people. Uh, I just want you to, if there's anything here in this place that is hindering your work, God, I, I want to come against that in the name of Jesus. I want to pray by your mighty power, you just free us up. And may we be undistracted as we listen to what I believe you've given me to say today. Lord, I, I pray for your blessing on the rest of this service. Thank you for being able to praise you, Jesus, through our songs. Thank you that you are our Redeemer. Thank you that you went to the cross and you shed your blood for us. Thank you that you rose again for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you are present by your Spirit amongst us. And we pray now that your peace and your presence, the sense of it, will be tangible and overwhelming to each and every one of us. So touch us now, I pray, uh, for the glory of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Can I read from Luke 2? Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 20. <clears throat> okay, Tom. Oh, I'm doing it. Sorry. I'm doing it myself. Is that going to work? Oh, good. Something works. <laughs> Almost deserves that, doesn't it? Okay. <clears throat> there were some shepherds in that part of the country, who were spending the night in the fields taking care of their flocks. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone over them, and they were terribly afraid. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for I am here with good news for you, which will bring great joy to all the people. This very day, in David's town, your Saviour was born, Christ the Lord. And this is what will prove it to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great army of heaven's angels appeared with the angel, singing praises to God. Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom he is pleased. And when the angels went away from them back into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and saw the baby lying in the manger. And when the shepherds saw him, they told them what the angel had said about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said. Mary remembered all these things and thought deeply about them. And the shepherds went back singing praises to God for all they had heard and seen. It had been just as the angel had told them. Now just a couple of verses from Romans chapter 2, and the first couple of verses, you'll know them well, many of you. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. <clears throat> this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Pray God will bless that reading to us and help us as we think about this question this morning. Does God like Christmas? I find myself asking that question a few weeks ago and it's been on my mind for the last few weeks and I thought I've got to just look at this and, and, and kind of bring it together and then share it. And I'm sure I'm not the first to have asked this question. Actually, there are a number of sites on the internet where people ask this question, so I've discovered since. Does God like Christmas? Or does he actually dislike it? Would God rather that there was no such thing as Christmas? Some of you may wish that, because it's been a very busy fortnight, and you're looking forward to the next few days, really, but actually it's going to be a lot of hard work for you. But does God like Christmas? I think it's a reasonable question to ask as God's people, don't you? Especially as we're called to live lives that honour and praise God, not in order to earn his blessing, but because he freely gives us his blessing. But we want to serve him, we want to honour him, we want to, to do the things that he wants us to do. And that's why I read those verses from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Be transformed, and then you'll be able to f test and approve what God's will is. What is God's will with regards to Christmas? 
you know, as we grow in grace and as we continue to offer our lives up to God as living sacrifices, hopefully we begin to more clearly know what God's will about these things are. He wants us to become increasingly like Jesus. He wants us to think more and more like Jesus, to have what the Bible calls the mind of Christ. To see things in our daily lives Jesus' way. To actually see things from his perspective and not just from our own perspective. So what does he think about Christmas? <coughs> Please don't get me wrong. I have no personal hotline to God. <laughs> so God hasn't sort of delivered me this kind of special message to say whether he likes Christmas or not. What I'm planning to share with you is, is not a new revelation from the Lord. It's simply a bunch of things to think about today and perhaps over the coming week based on conclusions that I personally have arrived at as I've tried to intentionally think more biblically about this question. Does God like Christmas? So don't misunderstand me. I'm not, I'm not trying to send you away with a guilt trip. Uh, I, I don't want you going away saying, oh, we've got it all wrong, you know, we're going to have to start again. It's a little bit late for that, all right, because tomorrow is the day. No, I, I would simply like to encourage you over the course of these next few days to not get swept along by the world's current, but whenever possible, just to take a little step back in order to remember who the party's for, you know, whose birth it is that we're celebrating. I was standing on Wednesday afternoon in a long line at Weymouth's card factory. I was feeling a bit stressed by it all. We you know, do some shopping and trying to find things that we think people would like to receive as gift. And I was feeling a bit stressful standing in this queue. And I think most of my fellow cures were probably feeling a little bit, but, bit like me, a little bit stressful. When onto the, the music system in that shop came the song Joy to the World. And I was just stood there with like six people in front of me and Joy to the World started up. And I just stood there and soaked in the words of that first verse. What a brilliant Christmas song. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. And it just struck me again right there and then that this is what this season is primarily all about. The fact that the Lord has come. It's not about an old man on a sleigh. It's about a baby in a manger. It's about Jesus. Frank Houghton put it beautifully way back in 1934 when he said this, it's about God who was rich beyond all splendor, who for love's sake became poor. Thrones for a manger did surrender, sapphire paved courts for stable floor. That's what it's about. God's humility and coming down to this earth in the person of Jesus. The Lord has come. The Lord has come. So anyway, let's begin to answer our question, does God like Christmas? By flagging up, first of all, Christmas stuff God surely doesn't like. Three aspects of Christmas that are, I think, things that far from please God. And the first of them is probably the biggest, and, and it's this, excess. Excess. Meet Lola, the pampered pooch whose story appeared in the Mail Online a week ago, or in the Daily Mail newspaper as well. An article that began with this headline. I couldn't believe this headline. But apparently she said it. I love Lola more than my son. I love Lola more than my husband. <clears throat> I thought it was a miracle that marriage is still together. So how many presents is Lola getting for Christmas? Just from her owner, I'll tell you, 68. 68, you heard that right, 68 gifts for a dog. 68 presents that cost her owner over a thousand pounds in total. The gifts include a, a red Christmas blanket with Lola's name embroidered on it, costing 27 pounds. Five bottles, five bottles of doggy cologne, averaging nine pound a bottle, that's 45 quid. A, a coat to match one of her mummy's coats that costs 42 quid, and her main present of a dehydrator, whatever that is for a dog, that set her owner back 147 pounds. 
Said the article, on the big day itself, Lola will unwrap her 68 gifts, which include premium toys and clothes and a special doggy Christmas roast, and she and her owner will wear matching Christmas jumpers. <laughs> this is the dog that has its own bank account. It gets £100 per month allowance into its bank account. Excess? <laughs> the word doesn't come close. But Helen Muller is by no means unique in this respect. For in 2015, mother of three, Emma Tapping, was in the newspaper because she gave each of her children 87 gifts. 87 gifts in 2015. She thought that wasn't quite enough, so in 2016, she upped it to 96 gifts for every one of her three children. And there's actually a picture on the internet of the Christmas tree. Oh, that's the wrong one. So anyway, there's, if you go online and, and, and put her name in Emma Tapping, you'll see all those pictures under a Christmas tree. And we can lose that just for a second. Now, OK, I realize these are, these are extreme examples. I deliberately chose them for their high impact. But I'm, I'm sure it's not just the headline cases of excess that grieves the heart of God. It's the excess food that we cram into our larders and our kitchens and our freezers, a lot of which let's be honest, gets wasted. It's the excess alcohol that many people will consume over the next week that will actually cause a lot of trouble, <coughs> fuel a lot of arguments and pain. It's the excess money that many people will spend who can't really afford it, much of it on credit, that will put them even deeper in debt, put stress and strain on already rocky relationships. You need one of these, screams the advert on the TV. It's 50% off, says another. Don't miss our Black Friday bargains that now somehow go on all week. <laughs> so it's a black week in the shops. Impulse buying, one-click transactions, interest-free credit, payday loans, online shops that never shut. Yes, folks, you can go on Amazon 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, 60 minutes every hour. You can go on there. You can spend your money with one click. They're the scourges of our day and generation. Excess. Is my life free of it? Not sure it is. I was given a book by someone you know this Christmas, a book for Advent. And here's one of the prayers the writer offers within this lovely book. Lord, renew our souls so that we may find what is good and acceptable and perfect in your eyes. Open our eyes to see beyond the lures of the world, the prizes of success, the rewards of wealth and position, the seduction of a modern life lived out at a frenetic and competitive pace. Help us to sever our dependencies on the world's distractions and give us an opportunity to find ourselves in the shelter and safety of your wings. Amen. We're looking at Christmas stuff that I'm pretty sure God doesn't like very much. We started with excess. Here's a second. X mass. Oh. Cards on the table, friends. This is one of my pet hates. Merry Xmas. It jars. It, it kind of grates on me. I find it actually such an insult. This very day in David's town, your Savior was born. He is X, the Lord. No, he isn't. Imagine it's your son's birthday. You have a party. You invite all his friends to come around. And one of them brings this card for him, a birthday card. And it says on the front, Happy Birthday, Michael, which is your son's name. <laughs> but the name has been crossed out with this big, ugly X in this thick black felt pen. How are you going to feel? I looked up X in my dictionary. Let me read you a couple of the definitions of X. Denoting an unknown or unspecified person or thing. So is the person that Christmas commemorates unknown? <laughs> no, he isn't. In fact, for the past 2,000 years, Jesus has probably been the most widely known person who has ever lived. 
He's known all over the world. His name is used all over the world. Jesus Christ, it's his birth. It's his coming. It's his incarnation that we're celebrating. Jesus, not X. He's not unknown. He's not obscure. He's not anonymous. His name is Jesus, and he is the Christ. Amen? He is the Christ of God. The second definition of X that I'd like to remind you of is if anything more sinister. For my dictionary defines it as a symbol used to indicate a mistake. So if you're writing a letter, and you remember those, don't you? They're things with paper and pen. Um, if you're writing a letter and you misspell a word and you notice that mistake, you might cross it out. Just put a big cross through it and write the word again correctly. And the cross means I made a mistake. And when I see the word Xmas, it's as if the world and even the devil himself is saying Jesus was just a big mistake. And that's why I dislike it so much. And I'm kind of presuming God doesn't like it very much either. Because no one loves Jesus more than the Father. But then here is the strangest thing. A Christian website that actually uses the word Xmas. And even with a small X, how bizarre. Well, yes, it is. And it brings us to a third X that I'm pretty sure God doesn't like with regard to Christmas. And it's this. It's extremes. Extremes. Now, I include this very briefly because the image I just put up was part of a web page entitled 120 Reasons Against Christmas. This is a Christian website. 120 Reasons Against Christmas. And the author lists 120 references from the Bible that he would say supports his 120 reasons. Here's a quick example. The Lord, this is his, him saying this, not this Bible. The Lord curses any gospel different than Paul's, he says, which does not mention Xmas. And to support that claim, he quotes Galatians 1, 8 and 9, a letter that Paul himself wrote to believers in Galatia. Let me read you the first of those two verses. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. So he reasons that because Paul never included Christmas, the birth of Jesus, in his gospel, therefore if anybody preaches a gospel that has the birth of Jesus in it, even an angel, then they're under God's curse. Well, excuse me, but who preached the first truly gospel sermon or one of them in the New Testament? I'll tell you, it was an angel. It was an angel. An angel from heaven, and God sent the angel. And what was the angel's subject in that very first sermon? It was the events of that very first Christmas. <laughs> a word my dictionary defines as the annual Christian festival celebrating Christ's birth. We don't have a problem with that, do we? That's what Christmas is. It's a festival celebrating the birth of Jesus. That's what it should be. I know it's become something else. But for us, <laughs> it's a festival celebrating Jesus' birth. And an angel from heaven was the first one to deliver a sermon on that very subject. It was something that, as far as we know, Paul never specifically spoke about. But I read part of that angel's sermon earlier from Luke 2. Don't be afraid. I am here with what? Good news. Gospel. Hi, guys. I'm here with gospel. It's going to bring you great joy and all the people. This very day in David's town, your Savior was born. How much more of a gospel talk do you get than that? Christ the Lord. And yet this internet critic says the Lord curses any gospel different from Paul's because it doesn't mention Xmas. Extreme. Absolutely extreme. That's what I would call such anti-Christian rhetoric. And despite his 120 so-called proof texts, I would have to call that website's conclusions totally unbiblical. The product of faulty logic and bad exegesis, actually, if you really look at them. Now, if you want to read something more positive and something actually more carefully thought through and reasoned and biblical, then type Does God Hate Christmas into Google and look at the second link on their list and it should take you to a very helpful article on the Grace Communion International website and it really is worth a read. And I was going to quote lots of it but I haven't got the time. There's a really brilliant article uh, about some of the things that people say, well we shouldn't you know, celebrate Christmas for this reason and that reason. It looks at a number of them and absolutely destroys them. So there is some Christmas stuff that I would suggest to you God doesn't like. Excess, because part of the fruit of God's spirit is self-control. And the word of God says that godliness with contentment is great gain. 
Xmas because the angel heralded his name. And Peter said on the day of Pentecost, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. That's his name. It's Jesus. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. And also extremes, this whole idea of pushing scripture to unwarranted lengths in order to support our own suspect opinions. Don't think God likes that much either. But enough of the negative. (laughs) Enough of what some cynics might label the bar humbug side of Christians and Christmas. Time now for something more positive as we look at some Christmas stuff that God surely does like. At least I think we can be sort of quietly confident that God likes these different aspects of Christians. Among the first, uh, among, uh, the first of them is generosity. The first of them. And that, in a sense, is the antithesis, the exact opposite of excess or greed. Generosity. It's what my dictionary defines as the quality of being kind. Synonyms include words like benevolence and charity and self-sacrifice. Christmas is a time for giving sang good old Cliff back in 2003 and pretty much every year since. And he was right, of course. Christmas is a time for giving. Have a little look at this. You've probably seen it. Many of you will have seen it on the television. Have a look at this. What do I want for Christmas? Little company would be nice. I just don't want to be all alone again. This Christmas, thousands of older people will spend their day lonely and isolated. A gift from you could bring company and friendship. Please call the Salvation Army now on 0800 655 6077. Text GIFT to 80039 or search Salvation Army and give £19 or whatever you can afford. What do I want for Christmas? I just don't want to be alone. Hmm. You probably feel the same. Don't want to really be on my own Christmas. In 2015, the Salvation Army's Christmas Appeal raised £15 million to help them continue their ministry to the poor and abused. This year, it hopes to top £16 million. That's a tidy sum of money. And most of that money is actually used by volunteers who freely give their time to help the lonely, the disadvantaged, the elderly, the destitute. May God bless them in it as they go about that wonderful work this Christmas. Here's another clip that you may just have seen this Christmas. Every day, Jean walks miles to fetch this water. Water so dirty, it could kill him. But he has no choice. Every day, Concilia gives her baby water that's teeming with parasites and bacteria. She knows it could kill him, but she has no choice. Today, 4,000 children will die from poor sanitation and dirty water. They drink it because they have no choice. Isn't that a global scandal? That this very day, 4,000 children will die simply because of poor sanitation and drinking bug-ridden water. Water Aid's goal is to see everyone everywhere having access to clean water by 2030. It's currently using around £60 million of its supporters' money every year to bring that goal ever closer. Clean water for everyone, everywhere. That's just a couple of current examples of people's generosity at Christmas, a fair chunk of which comes from just ordinary people through small donations of two, five, ten pounds. It's a season of giving. And I'm pretty sure God likes that aspect of Christmas. Not to mention the other charities, many of them that benefit from extra donations at this time of year. That's a good thing. Oh, it's not perfect, we know that. Some of it gets siphoned off probably in some of these poor countries by corrupt leaders and all the rest of it and people are trying to stamp that out, but we know it's not perfect, but it's good that people give, isn't it? And it pleases God that people give, no matter who they are. The Lord Jesus said, if you give even a cup of water to one of the least of my followers, you'll surely be rewarded. Folks, let's never belittle true goodness or genuine compassion just because it isn't done in the name of the church. Let's not belittle it. We know very well that good works don't save us, but that doesn't mean God doesn't approve of generosity, whatever time of year it happens to be, and whoever's putting the money in the pot. God loves a cheerful giver. Here's something else I feel sure God likes. Gatherings. Gatherings. 
people getting together, families having parties, even welcoming strangers. Believers meeting for worship, lifting up Jesus as we've done this morning. What did God say in Genesis 2.18? It is not good for the man to be alone. It's not good for the man to be alone. So what did God do? God made Adam a friend, a companion, someone he could share the day with, someone who could help him and someone he could help. God sets the lonely in families, says the psalmist in Psalm 68, 6. He made us for fellowship. He made us for community. So I say well done to those local people who dreamed up Mary Martok. And to those volunteers who will help to make it happen this year. And I say well done to the Sally Ann for bringing people together who would otherwise have spent Christmas entirely on their own. Well done. And come to that, well done to those churches up and down this nation and around the world who will be holding special services tomorrow, Christmas Day, who would otherwise, you know, uh, perhaps just be at parties and whatever. But they're holding a service so that people can come together to worship God. Oh, I know we can all worship in our own individual homes, but there's something about coming together, isn't there, as God's people that makes our worship seem even more powerful. Must be a blessing to the heart of God. Here's the third G word, gifts. By which I, I simply mean this seasonal practice of giving something to someone that we care for as a token of our affection. It's not a competition to see who gives the best gift, the most expensive gift. It's not to be an expectation, oh, if I give someone a gift, I might just get one back. It's simply something, however small and simple, that says, I'm glad you're part of my life. Here's a little gift. As I racked my brain for a minute, and it doesn't take long to rack my brain, I couldn't think of one biblical reason, actually, why God would frown on such a kindly custom as people exchanging gifts. Do you know if anything the Bible encourages the giving of gifts? Look at the references in the Old Testament to this. Gifts to one another and gifts to the Lord. And finally, the word that sounds like it should start with G, but actually starts with a J. The fourth thing about Christmas that God surely likes is the focus on Jesus. The focus on Jesus. Whether that's at Chris Tingle services or preschool nativities or written on Christmas cards or TV carol services, many people will see and hear the name of Jesus over these few days who would only otherwise hear it in the form of a swear or a curse. I saw a bit of pointless last evening. I just happened to have a, uh, a food break between studying. And uh, pointless was on the television. Very aptly named, in my opinion. <coughs> For those of you who don't know what it is, haven't a clue what I'm talking about. It's a TV show. Maybe you've not seen any of the zillion episodes. But even there, on prime time Saturday evening television, Jesus got a mention. <coughs> Excuse me. Wasn't terribly positive, but he got a mention. Hallelujah. Who knows what God will do with that? I've heard of people being converted in some very bizarre ways. Because God can just bring people to himself however he wants to. And if it's through Alex Armstrong mentioning the name of Jesus on television, then he can do it. It may just bring back something from years ago that someone's wandered right away from. Christmas is an annual <coughs> reminder that God became human in the person of Jesus. It's an annual opportunity to talk about his love and his humility and his staggering grace. Jesus. He's the hope of nations. He's the saviour of the world. He's the holy child. He's Christ the Lord. He's the newborn king. Any of these sound familiar? They're all from carols. He's the everlasting Lord. He's the incarnate deity. He's our Emmanuel. He's the Prince of Peace. He is the Son of Righteousness. He's the Lord Almighty. He's the King of the Angels. He is Christ the Savior. He's the Word of the Father. All from carols. He is the Son of God. He is very God. And He is Lord of all. Yeah. Hallelujah. And whether the world likes it or not, for a few days at least, the focus at this time of the year in many a place is on Jesus. I think God likes that because he loves his son. I think he delights in that. 
So, what conclusion then should we draw from these various pros and cons? Does God like Christmas or not? Do the good things about it outweigh the bad or is the excess so bad that we have to say, well, actually, I think God hates Christmas, as a number of Christian websites boldly do, like this one. Oh, didn't put it on. Never mind. Let me finish by posing some questions that all have the same one word answer. A word that has just three letters, the first of which is G, and the last of which is D. Here are the questions. Who gave the most precious, the most lavish, the most generous of gifts? That gift being his one and only son. Who sent the first Christmas greeting that was actually heralded by a host of heavenly beings? Who organized the first Christmas gathering made up of a family and a bunch of complete strangers? Who arranged for some Gentile stargazers to bring costly presents with which to honor his son? You worked it out? Not rocket science. Generally, greetings, sorry, generosity, greetings, gatherings, and gifts. <laughs> it seems to me that God approves of all of them. Don't get me wrong, the way we usually celebrate Christmas is far from perfect. We almost certainly don't have the date right. The likelihood is that Jesus wasn't actually born in a stable. New Testament believers certainly did not send each other Christmas cards or eat Christmas pudding. But the coming of Jesus is gospel. It's good news, dear friends. For if he never came at all, or if he came simply as God, as opposed to the God-man, we would still be in our sins. We would still be far from God. We would still be staring down the barrel at a lost and hopeless eternity if Jesus had never come. But he did come. And he did have a human mother, which set him on the way to becoming our perfect advocate with the Father. And for that, friends, we rejoice. For those things we celebrate, not Crimbo, hate the word, not Xmas, even worse, but Christmas, the annual Christian festival celebrating Christ's birth. May God help us mark it and honor it and enjoy it in a way that is pleasing to him for the sake of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to leave you with a 100 second video called the Christmas Gospel. May the Lord truly bless your Christmas this year. I'll just put the lights out and then we'll watch this little video and then hand back to the musicians. Thanks. Oh, I've got it.